Have you ever considered the possibility that depression and anxiety are simply pointing you to a deeper truth about yourself, which is that the life that you've built isn't serving your highest good, isn't serving who you really are. This is something that our guest today, Danielle Sunberg, realized when she landed that amazing job as a big law litigator in Washington, D.C., and then found herself depressed and wanting something else, in which she found out that she could walk away and actually build that life. Join us to be inspired that you can do the same. Soul Nectar Show, the Soul Nectar Show. You're invited, delighted to discover who you are. Anything is possible if you believe. So join us on this beautiful journey. Soul Nectar Show, Soul Nectar Show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Soul Nectar Show. I'm your host, Carrie Hummingbird, and I love to have uh, these conversations on Soul Nectar Show about what? About how to find our soul nectar, how to discover where is that? Where is that for you inside? How do you find your own soul nectar? And of course, on this broadcast week after week, we share stories of people and how they found their soul nectar and what does that look like? And What's the experience and what were the synchronistic moments that led to the discovery of that nectar? And we sit around the campfire together and we share our stories of how we found that divine opening. And uh, as you know, I'm Carrie Hummingbird and I am here to guide this conversation week after week. And I love these conversations. They open me, they expand me, they teach me. And I am here to evolve. So. I embrace the not knowing and I embrace the anticipation of what's going to come forth in every single broadcast. And so I'm really glad that you're all here with us today. And I'm really glad you're here to help us. Welcome in, Danielle Sunberg. Welcome, Danielle. Hello, Carrie. It's so good to be here with you. And so Danielle is a friend of some of our other friends that we've had on the show previously. Mandy and Shanna. That's right. Of Sense of Soul. We love those women. And uh, if you haven't seen that broadcast, go go up on Soul Nectar Show and check it out. Uh, Great broadcast with those two ladies. But we're here to talk with Danielle, who's also connected with them. So pretty cool stuff, man. Yeah, local Austin friends now, you and I. I know, cool, you know, Cool friends lead to more cool friends. That's the thing about it. It's like connect the dots. So Danielle is a former attorney, attorney turned a wellness entrepreneur, consciousness expert, and Reiki master. And after leaving behind the traditional definition of success as a big law litigator in Washington, D.C., Danielle traveled the world exploring on how to create life on her own terms. And through this journey, she became an expert in Eastern energy practices and now serves as a transformational coach and Reiki master to mission-focused leaders. And she walks her own path with her clients as they grow and actualize their potential. And she's really here to help people leave incredible legacies. So she has a co-founder, also a co-founder of a health and wellness hemp-based brand, AMA Healing, A-M-M-A Healing. And she's dedicated to providing alternative ways for people to ask, access their innate wellness. So I love that. And she's a mom. So, I mean, you had me at she's a mom. So new 15-year-old month baby. So let's get into it, Danielle. I know we were going to, we just had such a great conversation when we met mm-hmm. through Mandy and Shanna. They said, you're going to love her. I was like, I always trust them. So what... <laughs> I know we were going to talk about motherhood. I know for sure we're going to talk about that, but let's get started with just like, you're a big lawyer and all the, you know, the success profession, right? Right. And you were like, oh, I need to do something else. So tell us about that. Like, what was that like for you? 
I think that a lot of people can relate to this journey where you start off your career, you know, wanting to build success for yourself. And what does that look like? So for me, I was pretty much handed the algorithm of work hard, plus build your resume, plus get a well-paying job equals success. And then success has this like alchemical property by which once you have it, it can transmute into happiness. And once you're successful, then you get to be happy and you have this big exhale and life is just green meadows or something. (laughs) We're taught to believe, right? So it was pretty inevitable for me to have that path lead to becoming a lawyer. Both my parents are attorneys. And so it just kind of fell into place. Um, It was sort of written in the stars that way. I think I had a bib when I was a baby that said future lawyer on it. They didn't waste any time, huh? They got right in there with that. Yeah. They, they, they basically handed me my future, you know, and I think that happens for a lot of us. We sort of are, we see the models in our family and our, in our society that work for us. And then we say, okay, I can go do that too. I can go be that too. And so what happened was that after I started working at my law firm, when I, well, first of all, when I got the offer, it was like the biggest sigh of relief. That was okay, now I have success. That was the moment. Because for any young attorney, getting that offer is like the top of the ivory tower of the industry saying you're worthy of being here. You're worthy of being under our roof. You're worthy of being paid an insane salary. You're worthy of being taught and mentored by the best practitioners in the industry. And so you wear this badge of success for a while and you're like, okay, I'm worthy, but then it starts to fade because it's coming from the external world. It's not coming from within, right? So spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what happened was I, I started waking up and feeling dissatisfied and, you know, hitting that snooze button on the alarm, not because I, I needed 10 more minutes of sleep, you know, I just didn't want to go to work, didn't want to face the day, didn't want to like sit in my office and look at my computer screen just it felt overwhelmingly like that grind that we're all afraid of having our lives sucked into and so what happened was I went to my therapist I went to my doctor and I said I'm dissatisfied I don't know why this algorithm you know seems to be working for everybody but me I'm I'm feeling pretty broken And they're like, yeah, no problem. Take this antidepressant, it'll fix you. And that's sort of the moment where my intuition and I started talking to each other. Yeah, thank goodness for you. Consciously, (laughs) yes, it was, I mean, it, it took that amount of contrast. It took being told that I was depressed for me to seek other answers. And so what I finally realized when I held that prescription in my hand was that what had been pathologized as a problem wasn't a problem. It was simply a beacon, a sign, a lighthouse, a deeper calling from within saying, pay attention. I'm just offering you some wisdom. Please pay attention. And so when I finally paid attention, what I realized was that I'm not broken. I'm not broken. There's nothing wrong with me. The algorithm simply doesn't work for me. It's not my algorithm. It did not come from within Danielle and it's not what serves my soul nectar. And I didn't know the answer to what did my soul nectar want? No idea. Cause no one had asked me. No one had ever told me to ask myself hey, what do you want your life to look like? Or what are the things that you stand for in life? No one had ever offered me the platform to think about these things. It's just kind of this linear progression of values that you exercise as they're handed to you until you all of a sudden have this life that you've created and you kind of are like, whoa, where did that come from? And so I called uh, the firm and told him I was quitting the day after I won this 
incredibly huge jury trial, defended my client against a $6 billion judgment. And as soon as we got the jury verdict back that we had won, I said, great, I'm leaving, goodbye. And I had no idea what I was going to do next. And I think that's the point for where a lot of people, they get stuck. Because if we don't know what to do next, then we feel like, well, what are we leaving for? Like, what's the thing in front of us that we're going to jump into? And if we don't know, that's really, really scary. And so we often stay in the devil we know as opposed to, you know, the devil we don't know. But for me, the calculus was like, I could see into the future, you know, this future of, okay, becoming partner at my law firm and then living that life for years and years and years. And to stay there felt riskier to my well being than whatever I didn't know that lay ahead. And so I took that leap, I left the law firm, and my husband and I got married and traveled around the world with the backpack. And that's where I got to really discover what the answers were to those questions for myself and strip the layers, strip the labels and say, okay, who am I underneath the, the rubble of the persona I had built up as a DC attorney? Who is Danielle and what does she like and what does she stand for? And so that journey led me to then study Eastern philosophy and energy modality and get really involved and passionate about that because I had never been taught that we have anything more to being human than our mind and our body. And sure enough, once I realized that we do, it just sucked me right in. And then I became a coach along with it because I still very much value our cognitive processing. And so combining the two for me is this like really sweet intersection of personal development. That's beautiful. I love that. And I, and I actually think it's a really good marriage because what I notice about um, spiritual work is that it's very contractual, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of contracts in these beliefs that then govern our lives. And so actually like having a legalistic mind is helpful in tracking, like what's the agreement that now needs to be shifted so that something new can open up in the consciousness. So I actually think it's a good marriage between the two. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, that's true. That's a really beautiful insight. You know, we often walk around with all these stories in our heads that are actually contracts that we've agreed to believe and we can revoke that consent anytime we want. I know. Isn't that amazing yeah. you just have to become aware of it and then say, Oh, by the way, I changed my mind on that one. Yeah. No more. It's it. The first time I think that you realize that a story that you're holding isn't objectively statically true is like a mind blowing experience. And it can be something very tiny. It doesn't have to be this like huge thing. For most of my people, it's the firewalk. Mm, what's that's, the story that they have that they get to then expand from? That they're going to like get burned. Mm. And that they're going to maybe even, ex, you know, spontaneously combust on the coals, right? Like there's all these fears in our mind about like, oh my God, I'm going to walk across 1300 degree coals. That can't be good, right? It just think I'm definitely getting burned. Like this terrible thing's going to happen. And it's not true. It's actually not a definite. It's not a definite outcome. So that always blows people's minds. And then, you know, they're just like, wow, some people come back and do it again and again, just to remind themselves, like, wait a second, mm -hmm. these are contracts, you know, and they're, and we live in a very fluid universe. So we live in a space where whatever you believe is what ends up being true. So, and then you see a lot of evidence of it. So right. yeah, it's potent. And I know that you're, um, you're entering another <laughs> phase of your life with your child, right? Where we were going to talk about the mother wound some too, where it's like, you know, there's a lot of contracts for women um, inherited ancestrally, passed down through the ancestral line that we don't necessarily at this time in our lives, at this phase in human evolution, at this time on the planet, we have this opportunity to clear those so that our next generations don't get born into those systems of suppression. So what, what has your journey been like for that? You know what you're reminding me of that I think is probably
probably a universal experience to some extent is, you know, we have our own childhood memories and what our parents did, we focus on our mothers, like what our mothers did and, and the things that we think that we did terribly, the things that we think that they did that were like the worst, <laughs> the worst decisions you can make as a parent. Like all of us, I think, have that moment of like our moms did us a disservice when they did X right? And so then when we become moms, we hold that as something that we're never going to do. We're never going to make that mistake. And so we get to make the new mistake of whatever the new mistake is. But what that still holds us in is this attachment to our mothers and what they did. Because if you kind of can think about like, whatever your mom did as your front of your hand, using the front of your hand, then shapes what the back of your hand looks like. So if you do the opposite of what your mom did, you're making the back of your hand now, but it's still part and parcel to the hand. It's still in the same shape, it's just the other side. And so we're not truly free of the story of the experience of what our mothers did just because we decided to do the opposite. We're still attached to their story. And so that's how I think we tend to pass down the karma generationally, whether we realize it or not. And so, you know, the, the cool thing about being a new mom and for me is, is getting to decide what I want my hand, you know, so, so to speak, to look like, like I get to decide from scratch. I don't have to base it on anything having to do with my experience with my mother. How do you get to that place? How do you personally get to that place where you like deconstruct? Cause yeah, I mean, you have to start by knowing what the story is, right? You have to start by knowing who, you, what you think you received in order to deconstruct that and figure out what you want to do. Right. Cause it's, how do else, how do we know? You know, I would say actually that we don't have to and focusing on the story that we come from guides us to be attached to that story. And then whatever we decide is because it's being influenced by that story. And instead, if you focus on who are you, who do you wanna step up to be as a mom to this child? What do you want your motherhood to look like? Then that's you creating it from scratch. That's you creating it from within. And if what comes up as you answer those questions is, things that happened in your past, like that's okay. That's your wisdom that you're now using to create what you want to create. But it's a different place. It's a different starting point. And funnily enough, of course, like that's super analogous to the story I just shared about deciding what I wanted my professional life to look like. It's not having to do with the law at all that I based my answers to the question around if that makes sense. Like I didn't say, what do I want to use my background in the law to now then go do? It's just, nope, full stop here in the present moment. Who are you? Who do you want to step up to be? What inspires you? What makes you want to wake up in the morning? What do you want to share with the world? What lights you on fire? And move from there. And the same thing applies to stepping up as a mom. It's just, who do you want to be as a mom? Yeah, complicated. Well, I mean, guess it can be simple. It could be simple or complex. Either way, the complexity creeps in. But I think that seems like a very simple way to go about it. So when you were making that inquiry into who you want to be, you know, legal, switching careers and stepping out of law because you realize that's a dead end for you, like that's not the life you want to have. How did you go about envisioning who you wanted to be and what you wanted your life to be like? That was really the the service that exploring the world offered yeah getting yourself exposed to other ideas yeah and so you know like the currency and the credibility of saying hey i'm a washington dc big law attorney uh doesn't exist in thailand walking around you know what i mean it it, it just doesn't no one cares 
So I got to live the experience of my labels not having the same value that they used to and sort of becoming a nobody again. Like you just kind of become part of the mist of the world. And then I get to reconstruct who I am. And I got to do that by being exposed to things and people and ideas and, and experiences. And because my eyes were open, I paid attention to which ones sparked something for me and which ones didn't. And what were the patterns that I saw, the themes that emerged. And then through that, you know, building the foundation for like, what does Danielle want to do in the world? And that's really the simplicity of it. That's awesome. Yeah, I think that it's so important to get out of our box to realize that we were in a box. You know, it's like if you don't get out there and explore things you've never done, seen, heard, experienced before then you don't really know anything other than what's in your current frame of reference. It's yeah. like people, yeah. when I was a kid, we moved around a lot. So every couple of years we'd move again, right? So I was always the new kid on the block. And the experience that that gave me was that I got to see how different people um, constructed their realities as communities and as groups of people like in school together or their families interacting or in sports or whatever. And it was like, so it was this game of like figuring out like how they had constructed their reality and like deciding where I wanted to place myself within that reality for whatever time I was going to be there. But yeah. then going to the next place, you know, it's a completely different space. So you, you can reinvent yourself all over the place because nobody knows who you are. Like if you're, if you're a kid and you're in New York and then you move to Virginia, nobody knows who you are. So you can be who you want to be. Yeah. And, and I'm sure you learned so much, whether, you know, you realized it or not about the subjectivity of, of truth. And once you kind of get that, that all the values that we have together as a society that we place, you know, all of this value on, it's only real because we collectively decided it was real. And then once you go to the next community and you see how it's kind of tweaked and then so on and so forth. And then you kind of realize that all the stories that you have for yourself are only true because you decide they're true. Yeah. And that creates your reality. And then you walk around like that's who you are, but you're actually so much more than that. Or you have the potential to be so much more than that. If you let yourself out of your box, you know, we all make our own boxes. Of course, we're handed some parameters, you know, to make those boxes at first, but then we have to decide, do I, I mean, some people don't even realize they're in a box. Let's just be honest. I mean, some people never make that realization. They just don't have the challenges to their container to reveal that there's a box, you know? And so it's in my mind, you're never really liberated if that's kind of where you stay. Mm. You're just sort of in a fish tank and you're a fish. You never really realize I'm in a fish tank. I'm a fish. You know, <laughs> like, so would you say that I mean, people who, you know, live in their, their box their whole life, but are very happy are not like Free. Well, I think that they can be, they can think they're happy inside their box. They can be quite content. It's kind of like, are cows happy to be chained up and, you know, used for production of meat? Probably at some level, some of them are like, they're like, that's my life. I don't have any other options, right? That's just like, I'm born in, this is how it is. And I just live my life this way and I'll make the best of it. Mm. you know, but there's like, to me, that's always sort of a disappointment, you know, because I feel like, gosh, that's only what there is because that's all you've experienced. You don't actually know what's possible because you never tried anything else. You never like went to go explore. You never opened up the door and walked out and wandered, you know, to see what life might bring you. You know, I feel like for me, that's where the that's where the nectar is, is in the discovery process, not in what was handed to me, which I would call the book of fate, but in like the book of destiny, the book that I write for myself is the joy. Absolutely. 
I totally agree with what you're saying around destiny completely, that we are all walking around this earth, empowered creators of our lives. And when we don't know that, that's when we call ourselves, you know, asleep. But I also know that there's people who live so happily inside their box that have the most fantastic relationships with their spouses, with their children. They live thriving lives within their communities. They wake up every day inspired to be a part of that, to play their role. And who am I to judge? They're, you know, if they're happy, if they've created these meaningful relationships and, and happiness within themselves, then they're creating their life that way. Yeah, I guess I've never met anybody like that, actually. I've met a lot of people that put on a pretense of being that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then when you get a little closer and you have a little few more conversations, you know, you what I find out from people is like, well, I, I just do it because I'm keeping, you know, I'm not rocking the boat. I'm just, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just going to be happy with what there is and I'm going to make the best of it. And this is just how it is. You know, they just sort of accepted it. And that's, that's one path, you know, that's one path. And if you're aware that you're just accepting it, that's, that's a path. And what I find is that, um, especially well, there's just something alive in me that's been alive in me most of my life that says, don't settle. Mm -hmm. Like that don't settle call is so strong inside of me. Like don't settle, don't settle for less than your total joy. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's not like it's the don't settle used to be an outward expression, like don't settle, like get a better man, you know, for example. Now it's like a don't settle, like don't stop at um, feeling blissful today, you know, like if tomorrow there's like not bliss, how can I make bliss from not bliss or how can I be in bliss with the not bliss, you know, so there's okay. like. There's like a don't stop with your shadows, like don't stop growing, don't stop learning, don't stop, you know, moving through these energies and don't stop lifting, you know? So for me, that's just, I have, an, it's actually like in my Gene Keys chart, like that's exactly what I'm here to do. So I'm only doing my design. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe some people have some design that just says, hey, just stay put and just, you know, enjoy what there is. That, that's possible, you know, it's possible to have a design that says just, hey, hang out here and just do it. Yeah, I mean, like, so for me, what I've come to learn, learn about, you know, my own um, values, like what I stand for, is that the purpose of life, drum roll, please, no, <laughs> uh, the, purpose, <laughs> the purpose of life is to experience it, and that's it, and anything else beyond that is perspective or dogma or value-based, and so um to me like to put to put a a judgment on someone for the way they live their life whether i think it's contracted or expanded is my own perspective of their life but we don't ever know anyone's inner life or what you know what they feel authentically is true for them and so that's why I love working with people, you know, I work with people who I say are like mission-based leaders, but those people come in all shapes and sizes. And it's really, once you realize that you're the leader of your own life, you're a leader. And what's your mission? To live your life on your terms. Well, then there you go. You don't have to be like, you know, a, a spurlunking CEO to be a mission-based leader. Yeah. So it's kind of like each person, you know, this is one of the downloads I got in the second wave book was that every person has a unique thumbprint design, you know, and their proof of that, <clears throat> excuse me, our proof of that is that we all have a unique thumbprint. So, I mean, it's like the proof is right there in our bodies. That's what I love about it. It's like so obvious. Um, it's right in our faces and yet we can make it really complex. <laughs> Right. But it's right there is that we're all unique, you know, so we all have a unique design. We all have something we're playing with, learning, growing with, 
you know, whatever that. And I happen to be in a lifetime where I'm about evolution, where I'm about, you know, transformation. I'm about movement. I'm about on the go. So my whole life plan has been that. And I dig it, you know, and I have stillness gene keys. So I'm supposed to be in stillness while I'm doing that. So that's an added challenge, you know, and I, I know a lot of people who are like that, you know, we're not here to like go away to the monastery and be up on top of the mountain, right? For decades and decades evolving our consciousness. We're supposed to do it right here, right now, you know, right in the space, in the normal mundane life connected with everybody else. And so, yeah, like that thumbprint idea is really true. Like not everybody is here for the thing I'm here for. Not everybody's here for that. Mm -hmm. Some people are here to hold the fort. You know, I like to think of it like my mom is very super grounded. She's, she's changing too. She's learning, she's growing, she's changing, but she also has this aspect of her that's like Capricornish, you know, so she's very like earth sign grounded. And, uh, and I told her, I said, you know, we need people like you because the rest of us, like me, I'm whirling dervish. Like I'm all over the place, <laughs> you know, like I'm changing every minute. So we need somebody like you that can hold the fort, that can have the memories, that can, re you know, remember the pictures and have the family albums and, you know, keep us grounded, you know, in a timeline, you know, while they're, while we're hopping timelines. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, we all like interplay. We all have a role for sure. That's beautiful. I love that illustration of the thumbprint. Yeah. We're, we're, no one's going to be like you. There's no other you. There's no other Carrie Hummingbird. And so anything that you choose to do with your life is the perfect thing to do with your life. Yeah. And there's no more Danielle Sunbergs either. Like there's just one. And you know, that's the kind of thing is like, whatever there is for you to explore about yourself, you're the only one who can. And that's really where I get with people is like, you're the only one inside there. So you get to decide. And if you don't explore it and decide, nobody else ever will because you're the only one in there. So yeah. like, I can't do it. You know? I mean, there's, there's a lot of people that will tell you what to do. <laughs> yeah, I, and I, I avoid that because I only know, I know my plan. And so, pe you know, a lot of people that get connected with me, they're also into the same thing I'm in, right? So there's a lot of us kind of doing the similar things because we like it but somebody who has a totally opposite life plan is probably not going to seek me out because no that's not, not the, the client same talk to yeah your no. practice isn't going to resonate with that person no totally not exactly and you're but as you're talking about how you're you know you're on the go and everything is changing for you your background is also like moving through different colors it's <laughs> so cool yeah, it's pretty cool. It's like going from green to purple to yellow. I don't know if you do that on purpose. <laughs> no, it just happens. I think it's something if I move around, it's some Zoom thing. I don't know what it is. Yeah, there it goes. Like yeah. if I move like this, it changes colors. <laughs> I dig it. Zoom is cooperating with me and creating a mystical experience for everybody. Yes. Yes. <laughs> for those of you who are watching us back. So this is, uh, you know, so yeah, so it's really, it's interesting to hold space for that. So what you, from my perspective, to hold space for all of that, you've got to be dropped into like a really um, deep core, you know, like a source-based core of human expression in order to hold space for all the human expression. Yeah. I mean, that's essentially what I do. That's probably what you would say you do. <laughs> I try. Some variation of that, right? And, you know, really like how I see a lot of the work is seeing the client, the person, it can be a friend, like anyone who's listening can process this for themselves with, you know, the consent of the other person, if they want to talk about it. But, you know, you just see them as they're complaining to you about COVID or work or the fight they got into with their boyfriend or their girlfriend, and they're not sure if they're going to make it or whatever. Like, usually as friends, we sympathize and we get right in that story with them. And they're like, oh, that sounds terrible. Like, I'm, you are really going through it. And I see your struggle and I'm with you there. And I want to give you a big hug. 
right? But as, as a coach, we hold them in their perfection in the notion that, yeah, you might be, you know, in, in something, you might be going through something, but I see you as your fullest potential, as your most vibrant joy, as your capacity to thrive through any situation and find that bliss, if you want, that it's always there for you to tap into and your inner wisdom and that intelligence never leaves you. We simply kind of forget how to connect there because we get stuck in that mental layer and where all those revving thoughts are going round and round and round and round. And I hold them to that energetic space where they are able to get in touch with that inner guidance, that inner wisdom, that place where clarity and confidence and that calm center, that, that grounding place always exists, like the eye of the storm, it's always there. And so as much as friends are great and they can like get into the storm with us, what we do is hold people to their potential to be grounded in their storm. Yeah, it's so true. I just got such a huge reminder about that because <laughs> I've been in conversations about race, which are really hard conversations, like tough, dense, sticky, painful, conver ancestral conversations. Yeah. And I got a reminder that I, because I did an Oracle card pull and I did a ceremony for myself with my husband, who's African-American. So he's in the conversation with me too, but I'm in a totally different space because I'm in the skin I'm in, he's in the skin he's in. And we're like in the same conversation from different places. And it's really a challenging conversation, not for us personally in our relationship, but just in the, the larger sense. And I did this card pull and, and it was for both of us. And the, the, the solution came in the North and the North card was mystical shaman. Like, don't forget you're here to erase all story. You know, just be in the oneness, right? Be in the energy, just be in the core, just be in the eye of the storm. Don't get yourself in the storm with them. Be in the center. And it was such a good reminder because I got myself a little in the storm as you talked about, it, you know? And I got sucked in and I was empathizing and I was like, oh, this is terrible. My heart's just like hurting because of all of this. And I could feel my ancestors and, you know, their <laughs> interaction with it. And, and I just got so overwhelmed with all of those feelings. And then I had to re be reminded, like, it's not your role. Like, mm. get back in the center remember that everything is beautiful and i had this vision of mother earth saying this is i and i was asking mother earth i was like what about all this stench like what about all this stinky fog of like you know toxic energy and hurt feelings and like what about this mess and she looked at me she said it's good mulch <laughs> there's good lessons going on here what are you talking about it's great and i was like oh i guess i'll need to change my perspective <laughs> <laughs> about the stench you know like okay it's stinky mulch it's good it's gonna grow good crops okay like i'm gonna embrace this mess and it's okay it's not a problem that it's happening it's the neat freak in me that's like it's really messy people <laughs> are hurt i want to clean it up but i'm not here to clean it up i'm here to witness it i'm here to be you know a mirror i'm here to just listen yeah that's yeah. beautiful. I'm so glad you shared that story. <laughs> I was like, mulch. <laughs> and like, you know, you're just humaning by getting involved into the story with them. Like, that's so human. That's what we do. And then to be able to pull yourself out, like, that's the work that you do. And so that's easier and quicker for you to do it. But it doesn't mean that, you know, as these leaders in the spiritual space that we don't human ourselves right? We're, we still fall into these stories too. And, and, you know, like the thing that often pulls me back out sometimes when I find myself in it is my added um, agreement to the contract sort of that they're suffering and adding more suffering through my own pain of feeling it offers no relief to the suffering. Mm. It doesn't actually do anything productive. So to pull myself back into that grounded space of centered clarity and calm 
is making me now available to relieve the suffering, which is ultimately what I'm here to do. Yes, what a great point that is. It's kind of like, um, you know, in my Cidic expression, in my Gene Keys chart, like the highest potential for me in this lifetime, there is words like bliss and stillness and intoxication and delight. And these are the frequencies I'm meant to emanate if I'm in my highest space. And when I'm in my shadow, I'm more in my seriousness and judgment and um, stress and, you know, all of these words. <clears throat> and so I had to ask myself, like, what is serving people more, like in these conversations I've been in recently, for example, is it serving them if I'm with them in judgment and I'm with them in seriousness and I'm with them in the pain and the, in the crying and the tears and the the pathos of it or is it serving them more if i'm in my holding my cidic frequency of peace and stillness and bliss and delight and perfection that it's all perfect that is like my mind wants to argue with that because my mind's like but then you're not empathizing then you're like you're just being happy while they're suffering and that's really cruel because like you're not getting it and you're, you know, you're, they don't, they're not going to feel heard if you're just like blissful while they're suffering. And, but my soul knows that that shit's not going to help anybody if I'm down in the mud with them, like agreeing how awful it is. Yeah. That's not, that it doesn't serve it and it doesn't serve it. I'm not, it doesn't serve it to bypass it. So it's like, no, it's like, just hold the frequency while you're feeling it with them yeah. while they're feeling it be with that in the space you can do both sure it's a yes and yeah because duality and stuff right <laughs> <laughs> duality and stuff <laughs> yeah a little levity back into this <laughs> yeah it's just it's just like i i want to be so compassionate you know i feel like when somebody gets an owie, like it's, it's like, it's an owie, you know, like that's, and it's like generational owies are really hurtful and we're pulling out of that, you know, like we came here to change this. We came here to be a new earth. We came here. I believe this is my belief that we came here to do that at this time. So in, a, in order to do that, we have to do it differently. Like you deciding to go, you know what I'm doing this. I did this lawyer thing. I thought that was the path to success full stop that's so courageous and then to just go explore like a lot of people don't explore up until now and mm -hmm. i'm hopeful that more people will you know like get out there find out what actually is your bliss that's a beautiful if story you, if you want if you feel so called and you feel so courageous and you want to then there's nothing stopping you except your mind yeah, it's beautiful. So how do you like to work with people, Danielle? What's your favorite way of working with people? I mean, just talking. It's like this. It's like what you and I are doing right now. It's the one-on-one, -on -one, you know? So for me, I know that I sit in my grounded inner wisdom, that space, and drop in straight into it when I'm in conversation. And there's something about that deep listening that I get to do and hold space for someone else where my mind kind of takes a break because in deep listening, you can't also be thinking. Right. So it really <laughs> provides that space for inner wisdom to just come through and have something to offer and then, you know, ask questions and co-create like we're doing right now. And it's super, super fun. Yeah, like things more when there's deep listening happening on both sides too. It's really interesting what comes through. Like that's how I started channeling, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I started just letting it because it just, and I often surprise at what comes out of my mouth. I don't know if you have that same sensation, but like if you're talking and sharing something and I'm like surprised by what I just said. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> And then been asked for it and you're like, I can't, I have no idea. It's done. So People are like wanting to record the conversations now. 
I do. I record all my sessions because I, because that does happen. Yeah, that's a good idea. I haven't done that yet for my clients. I, I do record the group sessions, but I haven't done individual yet. But people ask for it because honestly, I can't remember. I remember key pieces like metaphors that come through from spirit. And I'm like, oh, that was cool. And I'm like remembering that one, talking that like one away. The mulch, right. The mulch. Like that was so cool to be in ceremony. And like I'm talking to Mother Earth. Like she just appeared to me in her own form that I could relate to. And I was like, Oh, you mean like it's good? Oh, that's going to stick with me. Mm. You know, like it's good that it's stinky. That means there's lots of lessons happening. Yeah. Wow. And anybody can do this, you know, which is the coolest part. It's just, do you want to? And so like for me, when I was training um, as a Reiki master, my, my teacher is very, uh, in close relationship to all the archangels. And that's who she draws upon when she channels. And she says, you know, oh, like Archangel Raphael says this, or Michelangelo came in and he says this, and, you know, was asking me to similarly connect with them. And it wasn't working for me. And I felt very much like I had taken this weird left turn where I was connected to energy. And then all of a sudden it felt very flat and distant. And I mm. could not channel the way she was channeling. And so what I ended up learning was like, that just wasn't, that wasn't resonant for me. I don't talk to the archangels. Like they don't come in as energetic beings in my, in, in my field of awareness. They're not part of my life. They don't have value to me. Maybe because I wasn't, you know, raised Christian. I, I don't know why, you know, but wh for whatever the reason, they didn't work for me. So I had to find my own way of channeling. And, you know, opening up receptivity to universal intelligence that lives in every cell and every atom and every particle between our bodies to the chair, to the air, to the ocean, to everything, right? It's there. So how do we access that? We just have to find the way that feels good, right? And so for me, that's channeling my inner wisdom is what I call it, my intuition, my higher self, that elevated, more expanded part of me that isn't contained by the physical. So that's what makes sense for me. And as soon as I kind of, you know, through trial and error, figure that out for myself, like, boom, easy. So, you know, maybe for you know listeners, it's going to be family members that have passed or ancestors or maybe spirit animals that you feel connected to, or it could be, you know, from your own lineage or religion or like certain figures. It could even be like TV characters or like Sesame Street or things from your childhood that like really have a powerful resonance with you or mean something to you. Like Big Bird really means something to me. <laughs> I have Big Bird come into my Reiki session sometimes, and I know what it's saying to me because I know what Big Bird represents for me. So it's just finding out, you know, kind of playing with and not having attachment to like what universal intelligence has to be for you to channel it. Hmm. Yeah, it could be anything. For me, it's White Eagle. And Mother Earth talks to me and depending on who I'm talking to, there's also like just, you know, different ways or different constructions. Mm -hmm. We're constructed differently. Yeah, that's what they're telling me. We're, di we're constructed differently and that's okay because we're having different life experiences. So we came into experience, not that we couldn't do it, but just, you know, we're infinite beings. We all could do it, but we're all choosing filters too. Like, we're all choosing those filters. Yeah. So I'm like a, there's a word for it. Pompous, pompous something. <laughs> I can never remember the word, but it just means that things can, can like move through me. Like I'm a doorway. Uh -huh. I'm like a doorway. So things can come in and like interact and then leave. So. Yeah. Whatever and that word is. Some people are more visually focused doorways and some people are more auditory or more emotion or just kind of that, that instant knowing. And so it's just kind of leaving yourself open to that wisdom coming through to you from any direction and in any manifestation. Yeah. And I like that you say allowing it to feel good because 
the body is really wise, actually. And the body knows if it's right, it feels good. And usually pretty easy. And if it's not right, it doesn't. Like you have to work at it harder. It's not quite, it's not quite aligned. It's not quite correct. So just like tuning into that too, you know, and it people often ask these questions like, how do you make a pendulum move? Cause mine won't move. And I don't know, I just kinesthetic. I mean, maybe the pendulum doesn't work for everybody. I don't know, but they just have to find the tool that does, right? You just have to keep trying different methods until you find new land on it. Exactly. And like the how question is my favorite question because that's a mental question and it's like linear oriented and like none of this stuff is linear and there's <laughs> not a process that you have to learn. It just, when you open up and receive, it's there. Yes. And that is such a frustrating statement for a lot of people that haven't gotten it yet or have figured out the doorway for that yet. It's like, but how? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, just keep well, practicing. That's all. Just keep all in love. Like, yeah, if you just keep process, like you can't, you can show you me what the look yeah. like on the outside or we go on lots of dates and he makes me laugh, but that's not how you fall in love. Yeah, it just happens when it's ready. Yeah. Like awakening happens when it's ready. It just opens up when it's ready. And you, so you just stay in the game. You just stay in the conversation, in the invitation and in the game until eventually it opens. That's pretty much it. Right. And every time it doesn't thing. work is showing you that you're in the game. So good for you. Yeah, man, you're in the game. So whatever, just keep walking the path. Yeah. Eventually the nut will crack, you know, and, and you'll get the gooey insides. So awesome. Or yeah, just come talk to people like us and we'll help you out. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Oh, but just like click that, flip the switch on. Ding. Yeah, dial this a little bit. You're in. Got it. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Well, that's awesome. So, um, how do people, do you have anything for people to get started with you or like, do you just encourage them to go to your website? Like, how do you, what's your gig for how people get started to know about you? <laughs> um, yeah, you can just go to my website and we can chat. Basically, um, I work with clients one-on-one -on -one and, um, there's no better way to get started than just to talk about what that looks like, right? There's no like hurdle to jump or anything like that. It's just, let's just chat about what it looks like. What, what, are, you, what are you looking to transform? What do you want to create in your life? Who do you want to be? We just start. <laughs> That's easy. Don't have to make it too complicated. Just go to the website and just book a little no. chat. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Very cool. Well, I encourage people to do that. I think uh, it's always good to experience someone's magic. And we can learn so much from each other. And we really are here to do that. Experience ourselves and experience each other and experience the whole kid and caboodle. The dogs, the cats, the birds, the trees, the rocks, the rivers, the streams, everything. Mm. It all has so much beauty to share with us if we're open for it mm -hmm. there's nothing else I feel like needs to get added to that it's yummy <laughs> yeah cool well so uh I'll put a link to your website and uh I just encourage everybody go ahead and go check out Danielle's website and book a session if you feel called and uh give a like and a share to this episode so it reaches more people and mm -hmm. people can can get inspired by some of the things that we talked about today. And maybe it'll inspire you to explore yourself a little bit more and ask a few questions about what actually lights you up and what you really enjoy. And are you having trouble getting out of bed in the morning or are you jumping out of bed and delighted? Mm -hmm. So, and which one do you want? Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna give people kisses. You ready? to? Give a All Reiki right. kisses. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Virtual kisses. Here they come, everybody. Mm -hmm. Yay. Felt mm -hmm. that. 
beautiful. Have a beautiful week, Danielle, and have a beautiful week, everybody out there. Thank we'll see you, you next Carrie. time. Thank you. you. And we'll see you next time on Soul Nectar Show. Bye for now, everybody. If you found even one gold nugget in this episode of Soul Nectar Show, will you do us a favor? Will you subscribe, like, and share this episode? Maybe even write a comment and let us know what you thought about it. We really, really want to engage with you at a much deeper level. Let's be part of community together. Have a great week, everyone. Bye for now. To dive in deeper to nourishing conversation, visit soulnectar.show. Soul Nectar Show. Awaken the Soul Nectar Show. Take a sip from the drip of nectar From the source of who you are Yeah, yeah